we mill about 20 metric tons of grain a day and there is no way that i could separate like you know which is contaminated which has really and which is so that's why the idea is that you know we can do that but with this large number of uh, you know it gets mixing so i we actually did a small study you know if we grow wheat in manhattan by the time it goes to kansas city it gets mixed up minimum 20 times mm. so there is a lot of mixing up happening in this grain elevator so there is no way that we could separate them Chew On is a podcast devoted to the exploration and discussion of food systems. It's produced by the Sunderland Foundation Innovation Lab at Kansas State University. Welcome back to our hosts, Dr. Marina Lovnick, known for her leadership at the American Institute of Baking International, and more recently as coordinator of global food systems at Kansas State University. Dr. Jim Stack, professor of agronomy and director of the Great Plains Diagnostic Network at Kansas State University. and Dr. Jeanette Thurston, the executive director for the North Central Regional Association of State Agriculture Experiment Station Directors. Milling of wheat into flour seems like it would be pretty straightforward, an application that simply requires running seed through a crushing process and sifting out the flour as the appropriate particle size is reached. The reality is milling is very complex, technically challenging, and requires fully interdisciplinary participation. Variations in the quality of the flour from the perspective of baking performance and large scale production has always been challenging this is particularly true when growing seasons change the seed mix and the impact of temperature moisture fertilizer use pest pressure and more changes the quality characteristics of the flour the need for highly educated professionals in this area has never been greater and with the expertise of the likes of dr kali silver K-State is laying the groundwork for preparing the next generation of professionals to better understand the impact of the milling process on the quality and safety of foods we eat every day. I would like to start today by uh, welcoming our guest, Dr. Silveru, and um, would you please give us a little background on who you are and what brought you to the area of study that you're in, which is milling, which is one of m- not too far from my heart. and um how you ended up at k-state sure uh good morning everyone uh, myself i am carly silveru first of all thank you so much for this invitation you know i would like to speak about my research and what we are doing this is a great opportunity for kind of doing an extension thing um so i actually i'm originally from india i did my bachelor's in food technology uh from uh, ngrang agriculture university southern part of india then uh, i went to do my food engineering masters from uh, indian institute of crop processing technology which is again in southern part of india then uh, i moved to university of manitoba for doing my master's thesis work and uh, when i was at manitoba i was doing i was working on uh, pulses and uh, how to uh, track these insects there is a nice insect which is called scalus brucus and that insect actually lays egg on the grain but grows inside the grain and it makes a tiny little hole and comes out by the time you know the grain is gone uh, so we kind of uh, designed the imaging technique where we can actually take the picture of the grain and see at what stage that insect was so that was my master's research then i went back to india worked for dupont as their technical uh, uh, specialist for their enzymes division converting starch to sugar sugar to ethanol then uh, i was so fascinated about that grain storage work i did and uh, when i when i were kind of i was looking for the schools then i i thought you know k state grain science would be the best because it started in 1910 it, you know it has its name all over the world then i wrote to professor kingsley ambrose over here you know asking you know if there is any opportunity for me and uh, i came here in 2013 august as a phd student all the way from india then i did my research on uh, wheat flour milling uh, as you know there are two types of wheat one is soft and hard wheat uh, whenever we try to mill them Uh, if my mill capacity is 20 metric tons i can mill hard with 20 metric tons but not the soft weight you know the throughput goes less so the question is why uh, 
then we picked up research you know uh, and uh, which was left in 1970s and i started working on like you know what are these particles why is it taking long time to mill them and all that stuff then i finished my phd in 2016 and i moved to usda manhattan where i did some grain storage work on phosphine fumigation all that stuff uh, then i was hired back as an assistant professor in 2018 then we were continuing to do a lot of work on wheat milling, wheat storage area. And uh, this uh, recalls on uh, wheat flour, wheat flour products fascinated me. And I was like, you know, this is such a low moisture product. You know, how is this pathogen is growing? And um, then we started uh, a kind of looking at particles, you know, what can we do? Where is this infection coming from? You know, where is it actually starting? And uh, in collaboration with uh, other faculty at uh, Food Science and Industrial Manufacturing Systems Engineering, we actually wrote a very big proposal for half million dollar, and it was funded by USD and NIFA. And um, right now I have two PhD students, one in, I call them as E. coli Jared. You know, he took E. coli, and the other one is Salmonella Shiva. He took Salmonella, and they are kind of doing fascinating work. And uh, I think we are we are leading in this area. We kind of um, uh, picked up, you know, what are the technologies that we could prevent this contamination, and also where is actually it's originating from. Yeah. Yes, as you know, that is an area that just piqued my interest when I first met you, and I knew that you were working in that area. I'd worked in that industry for many years, and it is such a big problem. And um, one of my coworkers used to always say, "I'd be the, I'd be happy to go hunting in the fields to stop the wheat from being contaminated, <laughs> from the deer pooping in the fields and the birds flying over." But clearly, there's contamination, and the project that you tackled is a big project for the industry, very important one. So. Very good. So I right away have a question. Um, and how do you separate the, plus the pathway being contamination versus infection, true infection? And we've there's a lot of building evidence now that Salmonella and E. coli are actually bona fide plant pathogens mm -hmm. that actually infect their hosts. So it's not just contamination, mm -hmm. it's actual becoming part of the, the ecosystem. I'm mm -hmm. uh, just curious. So we, we are not in a position now to separate them because, um, you know, we are dealing, you know, if I just take our Halras flour mill, which is at, you know, Kansas State University, we mill about 20 metric tons of grain a day. Yeah. And there is no way that I could separate, like, you know, which is contaminated, which has really, and which is. So that's why the idea is that, you know, we can do that, but with this large number of, uh, you know, it gets mixing. So I, we actually did a small study. You know, if we grow wheat in Manhattan, by the time it goes to Kansas City, it gets mixed up minimum 20 times. Yeah. So there is a lot of mixing up happening in this grain elevator. So there is no way that we could separate them. So that's why we, we want to propose an idea for the millers that whatever wheat you get, no matter what, just treat with these different treatments so that whether you have or you don't have, you know, you're actually, if you have, you're actually killing them. And if you don't have, then that's fine. It's not going to affect your milling or flour quality. Okay. Yeah. So what are those treatments that, that are you studying new treatments or are these treatments that have been available on the market? We are actually studying new treatments. There are some treatments that were available in the market, but the problem with those treatments is that they are affecting the flour functionality. So in a way, you're reducing the pathogen, but the bread that you're going to make out of it is not same as that you know, if you don't treat them. So that's why we kind of uh, did a extensive work on a um, thing called as cross-contamination. In the milling, we were so fascinated, like when we kind of looked at uh, the E. coli, especially the E. coli, it is actually creating a biofilm. And uh, it is sitting on those rolls and on the sieve stack. And whenever it is getting the favorable environment, it is contaminating the next batch. So for that reason, we figured out that the good idea is that before you get your wheat into the mill, just treat them with your with your technology, then there is no cross contamination or biofilm formation in your mill. So we, we, one of my students, Jared Rivera, did a did a study on how this cross contamination happens. And unknowingly, if you milled a wheat that has pathogen, how many batches next it would it would contaminate it? And we found out that five to seven batches, if there is no E. coli as well, it is going to contaminate. 
So that's why we want to treat and uh, these treatments, whatever we have worked as part of USD and NIFA are out and uh, they are available for the millers. So we kind of uh, did a treatment with ozone, with lactic acid, with sodium bisulfate. And uh, there is a beautiful step that happens in the milling. Basically, for every wheat, we add some water in order to toughen the bran and mellow the endosperm. So no matter what, we add some water. So instead of adding normal water, we are adding this lactic acid water, sodium bisulfate water. So you're, you're not changing any process step, but you're adding a separate thing so that you would get the reduction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it doesn't affect, like, the taste or the quality? Quality, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is no effect. There is no singular effect on the milling, flour functionality, as well as product quality. Yeah. Fantastic. So when I was looking into some of the work you've done, um, you spent a fair bit of time on this particle size analysis. <laughs> it, are, are these either salmonella and or E. coli uh, associated specifically with certain particle sizes? Yeah, basically the smaller is the better for them because smaller particles has high, high surface area. So that's why the smaller is better for them. So, and also uh, flowers that were produced at high moisture content because of their water activity, they are the, it's a favorable environment. So that's why we don't want to treat the flowers because they are very small and you cannot get a right treatment to treat each and individual particle. So that's why we are treating wheat instead of the flower. Yeah, okay, yeah. So once you do have contamination of facility, are you also looking at strategies for reducing contamination if it, you know, happens to get in the facility? And my background's water quality Mm -hmm. and um, dealing with biofilms is a problem in in so many different areas. Um, So I'm curious, how how does one reduce the biofilms in these environments? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, Basically, in the milling industries, uh, for the insects, that are basically in these bucket elevators and nook and corner of the things, you know, we usually use heat treatment. So we apply heat, you know, throughout the five-story building of the mill and get those insect reduction. So having this high heat treatment is one option, but uh, with uh, with one of the professor in the grain science, uh, Dr. Subhi Padriraju, we actually submitted a proposal on using chlorine dioxide because some of the insects are developing resistance to phosphine. So there are those insects that are developing resistance to phosphine, so we cannot kill them. So that's why we want to bring a new tablet for them, which is chlorine dioxide, and kill those insects and also the pathogen because we are doing a whole fumigation. We did uh, some preliminary work and the results are exciting that we see a reduction in the pathogen and we are going to do a... Uh, extensive study in the next coming three years on keeping these biofilms at different parts of the mill and doing a fumigation treatment using chlorine dioxide, you know, that way, you know, if we can kill those pathogens that are, uh, which actually formed biofilms. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's a very efficient process, especially for them. And they kill kill two birds with sure. one stone, sure. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. Any, any concern for the corrosive nature of chlorine dioxide on the equipment? <laughs> Very good question. That's, that's a great question. So there is, there is a lot of concern for the corrosive nature of the chlorine dioxide, but uh, uh, we'll have to see that that's something we are going to look into. But the wheat milling industry is already using chlorine in one or the other form. So they are using it in tempering step, you know, the chlorinated water or something. So we, we don't see that as a problem, but you know, we have to look into that. You know, Coming three years would tell us if, if that corrosive nature is, is an effective. But here it is like uh, we are actually in the whole mill, we are pumping the chlorine dioxide gas and just take, you know, doing the fumigation for a few hours and taking it out. So we don't see that being a you know, big problem, but we will have to see. Yeah. yeah. It might be the only effective way you can <laughs> and deal with this. I spent a little time um, working with uh, fruit packing industries and I was looking at dispersion of bacteria throughout the pack it's it's everywhere <laughs> they they get around the whole packing house in a in a hurry so yeah it's actually going along those same lines so thinking about you know the different kinds of oxidants that you can use your chlorine dioxide chlorine you mentioned ozone is it because it's too expensive that you didn't consider ozone because i would think ozone would be a little bit less of a hazard to the to the folks that work there over chlorine dioxide, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're about the same as far as hazard. That's a great question, and that's a great point. The reason the ozone is not being that effective is that the organic matter that we have in the wheat, 
you know we are getting along with the wheat we are getting a lot of dust we are also getting a lot of stuff and the more is the organic matter the less effective is the ozone so that's the reason it's not picking up but but we are going to study if we can still do a good cleaning and can get but uh, so far we have dra- done about six treatments uh, two of them exclusively for the industry so i cannot n- name those treatments but four of them out of these four we found that ozone is being the one that is less effective the reason of this uh, the dirty nature or you know the uh, dust in the grain yeah you'd probably have to kick up the dose pretty yeah. high yeah yeah. 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 yeah yeah very interesting great work yeah. Yeah. very exciting yeah. well needed yeah so the chlorine i i'm i know is used frequently in the soft wheat industry for mm-hmm. treating um cake flours and that type of thing so are you seeing any impact of that chlorine treatment on the hard wheats on the gluten proteins in the hard wheats coming through or is it because you're just treating the wheat itself it's not carrying through in the milled flour yeah that's yeah that uh, so we we'll have to look into that that's actually a great point right? we'll have to look into the whole wheat flour uh, maybe there might be some effect but we are not sure it right? but uh, in terms of the white flour we already did treatments you know the chlorine dioxide at a high concentration but we didn't see any any effect on the functionality of the flour so far yeah mm-hmm. but that's something we are going to look in next next 3 years yeah yeah so I want to show my ignorance here. Are you ready? <laughs> so looking at the the work that you've done in the past, you've done some really great work and very diverse as well, yeah. might, I, might I add, at least to my eyes, my untrained eyes. Um, but you've done a lot of work with pulses mm-hmm. somewhat recently. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if you can um, talk a little bit about why you're working mm-hmm. with pulses, mm-hmm. What you know, why a consumer would want to hear about pulses as mm-hmm. far as flour or other applications. Sure, sure. So I'm an engineer by training, so I kind of you know had my – hands on everywhere so but uh, the reason for pulse work is that um, uh, i started my research actually with pulses one of the bean called mung bean and uh, the plant protein market uh, here in the us and everywhere in the world is is increasing like anything and uh, pulses are pulses and legumes are these grains you know that have more protein in them so then there are a couple of industries which which basically uh, manufacture these ingredients for the plant pro- plant based meat they approached kester because we are leaders in milling on uh, separation of this protein f- fraction from the pulses so that's where we started this work uh, because we can do wet extraction using some kind of chemicals you know we separate the protein from the starch but the wet extracted protein it's good because we are getting high quantity because you are basically using liquid to separate but the problem is that the strength in the protein is lost so if you are making a burger out of it then burger will, is falling apart mm-hmm. so then they were asking you know is there any other technology that we could do and uh, one of my student uh, currently working on that his name is manoj what what he developed he there is actually a technology but we kind of came up with uh, right uh, right mechanisms to apply it it is called as air sieving so we apply air at different velocities and different pressures and separate the protein out of the starch and that protein because we are not treating with any chemicals and just with air so there is no change in its functionality and we will still have to see how the product going to be turn out so that's where we are doing and um, as you know k state we are you know the our milling program actually started in 1910 and we have a lot of wheat so we do lot of work on the wheat and we also do sorghum so sorghum recently i i work with one of the professor one of the uh, scientists at usda ars manhattan so there is a high protein sorghum so sorghum so far is being looked as a animal feed or or kind of into ethanol industry so we want to see if we can do this air classification of sorghum protein take it out and give it as a plant, you know plant based protein to the ingredient industry if they can make out of it so that's where we are doing lot of plant protein based work wow sounds really innovative <laughs> so air classification is something that's been used in the wheat industry for many years are you using the same technology or did it have to be adjusted for use in pulses and other it, it, other it, grains or yeah, yeah it has to be it has to be adjusted uh, in in many ways the reason is that each particle when we look at the particle it's so fascinating when we look them under the microscope mm-hmm. they have different particle size not only size but their densities their shape and every thing is so different so that's why uh, we'll have to adjust this nozzle technology where we apply the air at a certain pressure and velocity so that we take out that protein or you know extra, separate that protein from the starch as 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 
possible, as effective as possible. So we are at a high efficiency rate at this point of time, but we will have to see you know, how how efficient we can go. So there is a professor in uh, in our department who actually does on wet extraction. So we both, you know, I do dry separation, he does he does wet extraction, and we are separate. We are kind of seeing you know what would be the end product quality if we use these proteins. So we'll have to see, and we I, I we are hoping that we'll have a we'll file for a patent on this technology because we are first in the world to get this much efficiency. I was in a meeting yesterday, and um, one of the comments made was that the demand from uh, industry is greater than the availability of students right now in your area in particular. How are you finding students to <laughs> help help meet that demand? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, especially in our undergraduates, by the time they they are in their final semester, they have two jobs in hand. Yeah. So and uh, the industry is, uh, we are joining hands with the industry in recruiting the students. You know, we are we are going for uh, different trade shows. We are going for different schools. Right now, we are partnering with Manhattan High School and going to Manhattan High School and also to the community colleges and telling about our program and uh, saying, you know, how hard uh, we are hundred percent placed. And the minimum salary that for undergraduates is about sixty-five thousand dollars. So that was that. That's something we are doing in partnership with the schools and community colleges. And the other thing is that we are we also faced a lot of difficulty with the graduate students during the pandemic, because international students could not come, and the domestic students, whoever have graduated, they have like two or three jobs, and it's work from home. It was so difficult during the pandemic to to get the students. So, but I'm. Um, uh, so far, you know, I was success in my research, but I, I failed to convince a couple of students to pursue their master's and PhD because, you know, they have a fantastic salary. They are they, are, they wanted to do PhD, but, you know, not not at this point of time. But I hope and you know, I'll convince them very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Coming back can be tough. <laughs> so is that is that demand global in nature, not just U.S.? Yeah, it is, it yeah. is global in nature. It's global in nature. And the, and the food market. I, I believe the pandemic actually changed the consumer's perspective in terms of getting quality product as well as the safe product. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I see that uh, because uh, when I graduated from uh, here in Green Science in 2016, I, I might have, I have like one or two opportunities, you know, one at McCormick Spices and one at different place. But that time, the demand for, for the industry, you know, hiring a PhD out of milling is not that much. But right now, uh, my first PhD student has already finished two internships. Wow. And uh, and I, I see she would be a very potential employer for those both those companies. And my second one is already at one of the ingredient manufacturing company. And I see I see a lot of potential. The industry now hiring these milling students. It's 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 much more now. So Kali, I have a son who's thinking about coming to K State. And um, so, what would you say to him? I mean, what you know. What are the things that would entice a, a child like my son's age, who's going to be 17 here soon, and thinking about his future career? I mean, what are the exciting or stimulating aspects of getting a milling degree and going into that industry? Yeah, I actually I wish you know this is a, a video show, but you know I have a picture of my my two year old who basically you know playing <laughs> with this. Young. Yeah, he's <laughs> like he's like you know you, you can see this picture. You know he's oh. playing with the <laughs> wheat flour. You know my wife is making <laughs> my wife is making some dish, and you know he started playing with the flour. And this is where it actually starts because if this flour that is in his mouth is not you know might not be safe. Right. So I'll I'll just start showing this picture. You know, whatever we are eating every day, it's not safe. Mm. May may not be safe. So your son has an opportunity to turn this into a safe product. Yeah, and yeah, and good. and right from right from you know today, you know, in the grain science, you know, we have some fascinating students, you know, who come with different backgrounds, and the the grain science as well as you know this particular degree, you can apply your knowledge in different perspectives. So you can become a chemist, you can become a microbiologist, you also can become an engineer and do a variety of works. So right now I have five PhDs, one master's, and all those five PhDs, if we just you know sit and talk like, like how we are talking, each one of them is an engineer, one of them is a pure microbiologist, one of them is a pure chemist. It's like you have a wide, diverse group, and that's where, like, you know, if he can do an undergraduate degree in milling program, he can go to different places. 
Ah, fantastic. Yeah, based on what what he uh, what he chooses in these four years. Yeah. I think one of the challenges is that students don't don't think about milling as a college degree. I mean, it's not it's not in the purview of what of what's available out there. So getting the word out is is a challenge, but it is a it's a very lucrative field. It's it's it offers a lot of benefits to students. You're just not going to see it in many catalogs. You won't. That's you won't. Where you're saying about K-State People look at it and it's like, yeah. what is that? We are we are now actually going to different, not only to Kansas, but different uh, states and, you know, spreading a word. The reason is that the milling industry is, uh, we are actually, in one of the program, a uh, couple of industries actually sponsored us to recruit. So they are not having enough employees. So they were asking us, like, you know, let us partner, you know, we'll come with you and we'll kind of tell, you know, what exactly we are doing in the industry and, you know, how we how we recruit. So if I just go to a milling industry, so there is somebody who graduated from K-State in 1950 who is sitting at the upper head and somebody who graduated from K-State in 2020. So, like, they are only K-State employees in all over the mill. So they are actually partnering with us. And they were asking, you know, let's go and, you know, let's go together and, and find out some great students. Yeah. That's a great strategy. It is. <laughs> so, so you know, thinking about, you know, my son and his age group, you know, they're into technology, they're into these darn phones, they're into the AI is pretty cool, robotics is pretty cool. So what kind of opportunities in the tech space does a degree in milling science provide? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now there is one of the student uh, with me, her name is Anuraj. She's an engineer and she is very techy, you know. She, if you ask her, like, you know, she just sends message like Insta, sweet. Or she's very techy. So then she was fascinated by this artificial intelligence, data science, and all this stuff. And she was asking me, "Can we do something with data science?" I was like, "Yeah, we can do, but I'm I'm not an expert." So we collaborated with the faculty, and uh, right now she built a model where if if a company is saying, you know, I want to make the bread, and this should be my bread characteristics, the thickness, you know, this is what I'm looking in my bread. Where should I buy buy wheat in Kansas so oh, that wow. I could get this bread? And she has a model which will tell from which part of Kansas you should get the wheat so that you can get this bread. That's fantastic. That's and really we are cool. collaborating with Dr. Romulo Lolato in uh, agronomy, mm-hmm. and uh, he is he is doing no fertilizer, high fertilizer, low fertilizer, medium fertilizer, and irrigation dry land. He has like different plots, and uh, we to- take that wheat. And by knowing next year's weather data, we can actually tell the farmer in Kansas, saying that, you know, please go for this particular variety, so you not only get high yield, but you also get high quality. In order to get high quality, what kind of practices you have to do in your agronomic side? And that model was built by this particular student. So there is a lot of scope for AI, and uh, you know, in this particular field. So uh, the. The thing is that you know I'm trying I'm trying to I'm, I'm I'm still on old school so I'm trying to get on Insta and you know spreading this our website page you know and what we are doing because this is so fascinating and we never thought that you know can we predict the bread quality by knowing kernel you know if we answer then the answer is no like you know a year ago but today yes yeah so the data data the more the data we have the more we could build these models very cool thank you. I, I would think that would be an attraction to students yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, rather yeah. substantially yeah. this day. Yeah. You know, yeah. these days with yeah. Yeah. all the discussion going on yeah. about yeah. AI, that, yeah. that would be a big, yeah. big area of uh, growth. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> that would raise out of my son's yeah. eyebrows. <laughs> We're actually thinking of doing some virtual tours, uh, like, you know, doing our whole mill, you know, just they visiting it virtually, 3D visual virtual tools. That's something we are we are seriously thinking, and hopefully we can make it work in next one year. Because the students are different places, and especially after the COVID, they are they are with this mobile phone, so they want to enter the whole world with the mobile phone. So that's why we want to make those virtual tour of my lab, virtual tour of our flour mill, virtual tour of this field mill, so that they could actually see what what exactly is happening in there. Yeah. A day in the life of Dr. Silveru. <laughs> <laughs> How much of of what you're learning in wheat mm-hmm. is translatable to other commodities? That's a great question. It, it's very much translatable. Um, the reason is that the pathogen is pathogen, and the way the milling pattern of the wheat might be different from the things. But the idea is that the the agronomic or the crop side of the world is changing so rapidly. 
So today, if I want to mill wheat in Kansas, you know, we have roller mills. But if I want to mill some other grains, you know, I have to get a new mill, which is which is uh, quite impossible because uh, it it may not be easy, like you know, to get new technology to get running. So that's where you know one of my other PhD student is working. Let's use this wheat mill to mill all the grains, and we we have developed technologies for milling sorghum on a wheat mill. Uh, milling pulses on a wheat mill, milling corn on a wheat mill. So the uh, the reason is that you know we don't want to change the uh, the industry much, but you know just change the process flow what, with whatever we are existing and you know make it work. So tomorrow, if in Kansas, you know if Kansas is going to grow more millets or more pulses or more sorghum, but we can still use this wheat mill and you know and mill those grains. That's a great strategy. It's an important strategy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You think about the changes that weather patterns are bringing to farmers and not only the milling equipment, but the equipment for growing and harvesting and all of those things are going to have to be adjusted and changed to, to fit new crops. Yep. And uh, the learning from wheat is also helping us with some of the millets. Uh, this year, 2023, is called as year of millets. Mm-hmm. So uh, we are trying to bring, uh, I'm working with uh, uh, a few faculty in uh, College of uh, Agriculture and Agronomy, we are trying to bring pearl millet, one of the tri- tiny millet grain. But the problem with the pearl millet is the moment you mill it, you know, you are no longer able to separate the top bran layer. It's so tiny. So that's why, you know, people usually do a whole grain pearl millet milling. But we were seeing, because in wheat, we could do that separation. So can we use a strategy to separate that endos, uh, uh, endosperm from the bran in pearl millet? That's something we are trying. And the moment we mill, because it has high fats in the out layer, uh, because of that, the flour would turn rancid in few months. You know, it's hardly six to seven months, the shelf life. So is there something? Because here we are using some hot water heat treatment in wheat mill. So can we use that in the pearl millet and, you know, uh, knock out those fats so that you know it would not turn rancid in six months. So that's yeah. something you know we are we are learning from wheat and you know tra- translating it to some other grains. Interesting. I did my master's work on pearl millet, milling it, and you're right. As soon as you mill that, it it goes rancid very quickly, and it must be consumed soon, or it's not not edible. Where do you see um, kind of the future of milling going? I mean, obviously, you're you're kind of on the cutting edge. It sounds like right now, but so the thing is that we want to make a, you know K State. You know, if somebody has any problem in the wheat, they come to K State, no matter what which part of the world they are. So we want to make it for the same for the other grains as well. So if they have some problem in the food safety of grains or low moisture products like any of the flour. You know, we want to see, we want to make it as a center of excellence for both milling as well as safety in terms of low moisture products. So that's that's our goal. Yeah. So in the, you, you mentioned the work that you were doing with one of your graduate students on identifying quality characteristics mm-hmm. in the field. Are you working on any of these projects closely with the wheat breeders, the agronomists, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. Alan Fritz or somebody yeah. like that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, Dr. Fritz and the other breeders, they actually breed the grain, and Dr. Romulo would grow them in different things, and then it comes to Dr. Lee, who does the wheat quality, then it comes to us, then we do the safety and, you know, the baking. So it's a whole chain. Even in the wheat supply chain as well, that's what we are doing. So we were tracking this wheat right from the farm to it goes to consumer, but we are so far not that successful because it gets mixed so many times. Mm-hmm. But uh, what we are trying to do is where this E. coli or salmonella is originating. Is it in the field? Is it in the elevator? Is it in the grain storage? Or is it from the tar- truck? So we get so many samples every year, and we 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 also know their background information. So, so far we have done uh, about... Uh, 3,000, more than 3,000 samples sampling from different locations of Kansas and different um, elevators and all that stuff. And uh, so far we see only out of 3,000, we only see like six of them being positive for E. coli or salmonella. That's it. It's not that the others doesn't have, but we could not track them. And uh, this is giving whatever six samples we kind of located, they are either close to a poultry farm or a feed farm. So we were thinking that, you know, the poultry or, you know, the cattle, you know, that's where this E. coli might have originated. And we actually see a recent uh, outbreak that happened in 2023 in the U.S. is is out of Kansas. And uh, mm-hmm. about 14 people got hospitalized and, uh, I mean, sorry, 14 people were infected and two of them were hospitalized. And it's because of salmonella. 
Yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'm curious, is some of your research also looking at, so you may have a low level of contamination coming into the facility. Mm-hmm. Are the, is the environment right so that it could actually grow mm-hmm. and then grow to, and, and so have you looked into that? What are those conditions and... Mm-hmm. That's a great question. So most of the most of the contamination that we have seen is very very low. It's it's very low. But the, but the problem is that uh, in the wheat milling we add some water to it. So so far it doesn't have water, but we are adding water. So we are giving water. There is already shelter. There is already food. So there is something you know that is you know increasing it, but may not be that increasing so extensively, but it's still increasing. The other thing is that. The products that we we are making, like, you know, either flour. So we are making so many tons of flour every day, and it's being used in each and everything that we eat. So that's one reason of the contamination. The other one is, and, you know, I still eat raku <laughs> you know, oh, My wife it, is... <laughs> nobody, nobody do that. <laughs> so, so if there is, you know, most of the other product, because, you know, we, we don't eat raw meat, you know, we, we try to process it. But here, there is a chance that we used, we eat raw. So that's one more possibility of getting, though it is low-level contamination, but it's still contaminating. Well, and the truth is, you know, I grew up eating raw cookie yeah. dough too. Again, yeah. nobody do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you don't think about the flour. So when I thought of, and my what my mom would say is because of the raw egg. Because of the egg. Yeah. Never yeah. was the conversation, it's the flour, the other ingredients that we're putting in here. There was a major, major cookie dough recall I'm sure you're familiar with several years ago that... It took them quite a while to figure it out, but it did come down to the flower. They never identified exactly where that contamination came from, but that was, I think... In, in, even in 2023, we have a raw chocolate cookie dough recall. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I was going to say, you mentioned how, um, how low level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what technologies are you using to actually detect and identify? That's a great point. At this point of time, we are usually using the standard plating technique. But uh, there is a professor in uh, industrial engineering with whom we are actually making a sensor. So like how we detect your moisture and temperature, we are trying to make a sensor out of it. And uh, the professor, he, he's collaborating with other professor in, uh, you know, in, in physics department. So they are actually taking grain dust. Mm-hmm. So dust is actually money. So nobody wants to take out the dust. So they take the dust and they are actually turning it to, into a carbon product. And with that product, they are making sensor. So we are actually doing this circular bioeconomy concept. So dust, which is a waste in the grain industry, is now used to make one of the carbon product which we are using in sensor. And that sensor, again, is coming back into the grain industry to detect this E. coli. So we were at a file log detection so right now, but we want to, uh, we are still writing, you know, working, looking for partners and writing proposals on that area, on that concept, so that, you know, we could take that to a low level detection as well yeah but we we are actually working on sensors okay yeah. Yeah. i have another question yeah. if it's okay yeah. i i you know looking at your bio um i just want to congratulate you on so many early career awards you know i wouldn't call you early career anymore but so in thinking about um new faculty and, and folks that are just starting their career or maybe even a phd student who wants to go into academia mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, Jim right here wants to, wants to hear the answer to this question. Um, what would you recommend um, an early career faculty member or a student who's thinking about going into faculty on how to be successful? But also, I mean, we just heard that you have a lovely family, uh, you know, a little boy at home. How do you balance that uh, work-life uh, balance? It is, I, I guess, for, um, I'm, um, I'm so blessed that, you know, I started my U.S. journey in Manhattan. And I'm a, I'm a Manhattan now, you know, I'm, I'm here from the last 11 years. So... The reason is why I'm saying this is, you know, I, I did my PhD here, so I just stepped out for a year and came back. So I know what exactly Kansas State University offers, you know, way before I came here. So I hit the ground running, you know, right from right from January. And I have two lovely mentors, you know, who kind of checks on me like, you know, hey, you know, you're, what you're doing is right, what we are doing is wrong, you know, that's, that's something that helped. And, you know, Kansas State University has a beautiful program for the early career faculty members. So in 2018... Uh, all the faculty who joined in 2017 fall or spring, they actually took us to Washington, D.C. So we went, visited uh, NSF, we visited USDA headquarters. So we know, you know, that opportunity gave us, like, you know, hey, how can we write a proposal? And there are a lot of proposal writing workshops, you know, there is a lot of teaching workshops that, that is being offered in Kansas. And I don't see that much happening in the other universities, but that's a great one. That's a great thing. And we all went in the same flight to Washington, D.C. So that actually gave us an opportunity to 
talk in between us, you know, what they can do and what we can do. So we got half million dollar proposal in 2020 and we didn't collaborate with any other faculty in, in the U.S. It's just with the faculty from Kansas. And that's highly unlikely to happen, you know. So we have faculty in engineering. That that trip actually gave us a lot of opportunity and we collaborated. And I see a lot of uh, my friends who, who came on the trip also have NSF Career Awards because, you know, we all started together and we, we were talking from day one in, in Kansas State University. That's great. It's unfortunate that's the last time that that trip was taken, and I don't know that it's going to happen in the future. I was with you on that trip, and it was, oh, what a wonderful experience in, in learning and in meeting new faculty from across the, across the board. Yeah, I mean, especially because of the pandemic, it might not happen, but that's right. something. And right now, there is a couple of faculty who got NSF careers and uh, career awards, and they are going to train the next faculty who is coming to Kansas, you know, they're doing these workshops. And, you know, we have global food systems. That's something that helped, you know, for me to start this uh, safety work. So then that gave us, yeah. yeah the seed grant, right? Yeah, yeah. the seed yeah. grant, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah great. What, besides what was just mentioned, what, what else should K-State be doing to help young faculty uh, fast track, basically, their, their development? I, I guess K-State is, at this point of time, we have three, two to three seed grants, you know, that is helping. But uh, I wish uh, K-State should have a course for these PhD students, you know, or, or a program for the PhD students who want to enter into the academia. You know, that is something I was missing when I was at K-State as a student. But at different universities, they have a program for the PhD students where they could actually you know, take some courses or take some training in their PhD degree so that they can get into the academia. But that's that's missing in case at this point of time. That would be a great one because I have two students who are really, really interested in academia, but uh, they're not getting that formal, you know, training, you know, in terms of, but whereas at different schools, they have these formal training classes. So and it's appearing in their CV. And when we are getting the CVs from that particular university versus K-State, and they have a little extra edge because they have formally trained, yeah. Mm. Do you think the the needs are common enough that that could be a university level mm -hmm, course, mm -hmm. or does that have to be unique to college? No, no, it it can be a university level course because you know once once you are entering entering into teaching, you know, designing a teaching philosophy, designing a teaching material, however you are not doing, you know, that would actually give a, a scope or you know uh, you know a learning for the student so that they could they could do that. Yeah. It's interesting that we have figured that out for incoming freshmen, but not incoming yeah, faculty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I was curious as to in, in universities where you've seen that program available, where, where does it fall within the university if it's not within a college? Mm -hmm. What centralized area usually carries that? Yeah, I actually uh, took that course uh, because my advisor moved to Purdue and I, I did some work at Purdue for three, four months. And that, during that time, I actually took that course. So what they do is it's a four credit course, which is which is at a 800 level. And across the university, anybody can and register into that course. And you to talk about like, you know, how can we start an academic CV? It starts with that course. And so the faculty would come and, you know, talk about, you know, how did they build their academic CV? You know, what, what exactly, you know, the university looks for academic CV. Then they talk about teaching philosophy. They talk about research philosophy. They talk about collaborative writing. They talk, talk, talk about collaborative teaching. So in that course, we actually end up writing a collaborative grant. So that's one of the major assignments. So we were starting the collaboration right from, you know, in the university level. So that's something, yeah, yeah. And usually it, it happens during the summer semester so that there is nothing happening. Yeah, yeah. Good. That's something that should be pursued. It, it um, is. We, we need to figure out the right, the right avenue to, to move down that. That's what I'm but, going yeah. through my mind. Where, where does that live? But the, we, you may get called upon to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to comment. Be and, careful and, what you say on this yeah. podcast. <laughs> well, no, it's a very No, it's a good great point. idea. It's a very yeah. good point. But for uh, early career faculty, you know, everything is right at Kester because, you know, we have seed grant just to get started so we generate some preliminary data and use that seed grant and that's what i did so i got we got a global food systems grant where i collaborated with faculty in food science faculty in engineering and we got that grant in 2018 then we start use that data and got the usd and EFA proposal half million in 2020 so that's how yeah it's it's right there and right now there is one more uh, million dollar grant where we can do you know yeah it's uh, i forgot the name but it is 
the grip. Yeah, the grip. The grip. Proposal, yes, the grip. Yes, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we were not successful this time, but I was a part of two proposals, you know, that got selected for to submit a full proposal and, you know, that collaboration started. So, yeah. so we, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. That's, that's the point of those, yeah. just to get that collaboration in place and going. So that's great. That's great. Do you have any any questions for us or comments or things that you'd like to add that we, we didn't touch on here today? Oh, no, no. You kind of <laughs> we covered all, the <laughs> all, all, all the research that we were doing. And uh, thanks for this opportunity and, uh, you know, uh, you know, talking to different people. You know, it would, it, it's a great honor for me as well, you know, talking to all of you. And uh, and I just want to mention one thing is that the flour and raw cookie dough are not safe to eat it raw. So, you know, just process them, just process them and eat so that, you know, so that, you know, it, it, it is safe. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Though, though we do know that there are companies that, that make yeah. cookie dough ice cream that have, I mean, they've got a whole separate line and containment and delivery facility for that flour that's been sanitized, yeah. So we buy, when I'm really lazy, I don't make cookie dough from scratch. I buy it. And the cookie dough that you buy in the store now says you can eat this yes. mm-hmm. raw. Yeah. So yes. it must be the separate yeah. line. Yeah. yeah, separate line, yeah. And the things that, that he commented that sometimes the treatment of that of that flour to, to sterilize it will change the characteristics of baking but when you're making it into dough that doesn't yeah, really matter, matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. so you can exactly yeah exactly. so you can you can make those changes yeah. and yeah and make it a safe thing to eat yeah last year it was a very big recall in uh, France um, they made frozen pizza and uh, people just tasted it you know without you know, processing it. And uh, 52 of them actually developed, uh, you know, 52 or a hospitalized and two passed away because of developing hemolytic oh, uremic syndrome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and that facility is closed forever, you know, because, yeah, they, they identified that, you know, it's, it's because of the E. coli that came from that particular place, yeah. facility. And, yeah. 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 Um, I'll go into detail, but we think this is going to get a whole lot worse before it gets better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 We, we never thought about this, you know, when I was growing and it's an easy thing, you know, for me to just taste it, you know, yeah. But now, you know, it's, it's changing, yeah. So do you envision, like, kind of in the produce industry where they have to go into their fields and take so many samples? Mm-hmm. I mean, do you mm-hmm. envision at some point the industry is going to have to start sampling for yeah, specific I, I, that, pathogens? That's, that's actually ha- already happening. It's, it is. Now. I didn't know yeah, so yeah, shows my ignorance. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. It is already happening. So are they, what are they sampling? Are they sampling their products after they made it? Are they sampling the flour? Are they sampling yeah, everything? They're, they're sampling everything. They are actually taking swabs and sampling even the rolls, sieves, yep. you know, all those process lines. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's been going on for some time. But, but they're in live the challenge sampling yeah. Yeah. sampling yeah. is I was just going to bring issue. that up yeah. sampling how much sampling how many samples yeah, yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons I asked about the technology question for detection earlier um, the technologies are quite sophisticated but we haven't really advanced much in our thinking on how to sample well but not only that I mean also being able to extract whatever it is you're trying to detect from the sample I mean that is always been yeah, the limiting yeah, step yeah, is the yeah, cleanup yeah, step. Yeah, yeah. Detection methods, if you've got a clean sample, you can get really yeah. low detection yeah. levels. Yeah. But the comp- the complex sample and pulling yeah. whatever it is is really and a, difficult. And a protocol for one matrix may not work for oh, another yeah. matrix. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's where we want to get this dipping sensor technology and see if we, if we can advance further and still detect this low level, even in the wheat, even in the flour. That's something we are trying, but, you know, we are looking for some young minds, you know, to take that, you know, yeah, because their, their thought process is, is so different. Yeah, well, you're an engineer. You guys are going to figure it out before we do. <laughs> Job security. <laughs> well, it For goes back on while. the sampling side. How many samples? You said you've done 3,000 samples? Than, yeah, than, and how many were contaminated? Six. Six. So if you're doing a sampling. But see, that's the bigger challenge. Yeah. It is. It, it's, yeah. And yeah. On the, from the sampling perspective. Yeah. Yep, is absolutely. You're, you're looking for a, a low frequency, high low consequence. Frequency. Yep. Those are the hardest. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll push back a little bit, though. Do you know the efficiency of your ability to recover from those samples? So it could be that it's a really low level all throughout, mm-hmm. but it also could be that you're just not extract your, your you ability, not getting, yeah, yeah, your yeah. efficiency of extraction is. Well, that's why I asked about the technologies yeah. before, yeah. So and, we, and plating's not an efficient. No, we. It, it's not that you know. Uh, only six of them has infections, so there might be some, but we we, we missed it yeah. when we didn't get them. But that's why we want to get into a technology where, at this point of time in the milling industry, we have a color sorter. 
So mm-hmm. each and every kernel that we mill the wheat, you know, it goes through a color sorting technology oh, wow. based on the kernel. If it has a fusarium damage, it has a heat damage or something, it will kick out the kernel. Huh. So tomorrow we actually want to go to that extent, you know, where you check each and every kernel, you know, by this sensor or, you know, at least some point of sampling because that probe would be sitting in the line where that is going and it would tell us, like, you know, if there is E. coli load or not. So that's where we want to grow. Oh, so interesting. Wow, that's okay. cool. They do something, if I understood what you're talking about, they do something like that already for ground uh, peanuts mm-hmm. where yeah. it's they... Um, if you've ever been to one of those plants, it's, it's, it truly is amazing <laughs> where every kernel is looked at mm-hmm. and they go through tubes mm-hmm. and it's a color background match. Mm-hmm. 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 And if it doesn't match, yeah. but as it's going down, yeah. a blast of air pushes it out of yeah. the stream and it goes to these yeah. different yeah. Yeah. segregations yeah. for, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's all that we, even in the wheat, you know, we actually do it. Even for the corn, you know, we do that, you know, because... Uh, so if we have, you know, like that's that's the problem here. You know, if we have this E. coli making the kernel different color, that would have been amazing. Like so, we could we could knock out because we have that. But but that's something you know we we can do. We can we we want to get there. We today we not we are not there, but you know that is something where we want to make a safer product and we want to make sure that each and every kernel is safe. Is there any potential of NIR picking up? Yeah, that pathogen. is something. Yeah, You're that is something we are one. doing. Yeah. So we are doing some uh, hyperspectral imaging. Yeah. Uh, the hyperspectral, you know, in the NIR region, we can take the camera, take the image, and see if there there we can do. But that's something we will have to see. We have yeah. to NIR see, yeah. technology is already heavily embedded. Heavily embedded. In so the it's milling well, industry. Yeah, so yeah, it would be interesting if there was some other way to. And it's advanced enormously oh, in the yeah. last twenty years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in the beginning, a lot of promises, not yeah, much. Not much coming out of it. So that's what I wish I could do. I could actually got into medical. I, I got an offer when I was at University of Manitoba because we were this this uh, insect that I was talking about. It actually lays an egg on the top, and we don't see anything, especially a small white dot on the top. The kernel looks so perfect, and in 26 days, you actually t- see a tiny round hole, and the adult comes out of that. So there is no way that we could detect unless we break the grain. So then we we designed a technique. You know, take the picture, and that picture would tell you. Uh, you know, whether there is insect in it or not. You know, if it is there, at what stage it is there? Is it larva? Is it pupa? You know, what stage it is? So that time I got an offer from the medical school, you know, asking, you know, hey, can you use the same technology and, you know, detect these, you know, separate the tumors, you know, whether it is cancerous or not. Mm-hmm. But I didn't I didn't go because my, my heart is in grain, but that would have been, you know, so there is something that we can take from the medical field yeah. today, you know, which they're, they're advanced, yeah. That would have been a cool yeah. part of our discussion. It would actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Next time. Next time. Next round. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's what we were thinking. You know, learn from different fields and see if we can apply. So we are doing this imaging technique. We are developing sensors. We are working from different avenues. See if we can find out a solution where, at, at some uh, very soon or you know, I hope it it happens soon that we check each and every kernel and see if it has E. coli or salmonella or not. If not, then we process them. If, if it is there, then we knock it out. Yeah, That's cool. Fascinating. Well, congratulations on a great start to a career. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> uh, yeah, very interesting. We'll watch you from Earth as you shoot up into the <laughs> universe. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, it's exciting research. Yeah, it's very, cool. very exciting. There's a lot to come out of this. We are. we are. So any other questions from you two? So, yeah. Just please. one more on the education side. Um, one of the things that this is my perspective <laughs> that we don't do particularly well in the College of Agriculture <laughs> is actually expose agriculture students to agriculture. <laughs> uh, well, no, they get kind of tracked into a discipline. <laughs> And they know very little about the industry side. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. ag industry is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And very few of our students get much exposure to that. What, what's the answer to that? It, I mean, is it like a, a summer course where we put them in a bus and we just drive them around mm-hmm. the state and visit mm-hmm. mills? We visit mm-hmm. pack, you know, processing. We visit what, – what's – the right way to, to give them that exposure that not just educates them in their discipline, but fascinates them with the field of agriculture. That's actually a great point. But, uh, you know, in the Department of Grain Science, we have been doing it from right from day one. So in the Grain Science Department, we actually have a GRSC 100 course. 
so where each professor in the grain science you know each teaching instructor in the grain science would go to that class and talk to these freshmen about what actually we do and the case state in especially the grain science department the the beauty of our department is if you give us a sample of 1 kg we can mill it if you give us 110 we can mill it so we have a wide range so we have a pilot scale mill both feed mill and a uh, flour mill in our, in our campus in the north side and we actually take these students to those mills so we actually expose them and they they have a class where they run the mill on their own and uh, if they are doing it on lab scale we actually sell our flour in in call hall so there is a milling club which makes flour packs them and sells it and wh- whatever we sell you know the part of it goes to the milling club and that milling club actually makes these tours so each year we have a iom meeting that happens and whenever they go to iom meeting they actually go to different flour mills so whoever is involved in that club you know takes that money and you know visit those industries and uh, every summer right from the freshman they actually have internship opportunities mm-hmm. so they go to the mills and after going to the mills they actually they come back and it actually changes their perspective i i'm no doubt yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that's why yeah. i yeah. think yeah. that's yeah. that's a missed opportunity for us with our students just for clarification IAOM is International Association of Operative Millers. So the students are then given one-on-one, actually, with people in working in the industry worldwide. And, yeah, it's a really, really interesting so meeting. So the, the milling program is, you know, is so well connected with the industry. So they, they kind of go from day one, yeah. Again, thanks. Great discussion. Thank Appreciate yeah, it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you have questions or comments you would like to share, check out our website at lib.ksu.edu backslash innovation dash lab and drop us an email. Our music was adapted from Wayne Goins' album, Chronicles of Carmela. Special thanks to him for providing that to us. Something to Chew On is produced by the Sunderland Foundation Innovation Lab at Kansas State University.